All right. I, I'm Mike, and I'm going to talk about boot time memory management. Uh, so these are topics I'm going to cover more, more or less to some level of details, is how Linux initializes its memory management subsystem, what happens from that perspective from the moment Linux starts after bootloader jumps into it, uh, and until the moment uh, it is possible to use uh, page allocation and kmalloc and all the uh, usual allocation methods we know from the kernel development. And one of the topics uh, that I'll cover is memblock, which is a boot time memory management of the Linux kernel. What APIs does it provide to the developers and how they can and should be used. So normally when we develop the kernel code, we use alloc page, kmalloc, kmm, cache alloc, or whatever other allocator there is there. And uh, in the end, uh, every allocation in the kernel boils down to body page allocator granting uh, some physical memory to that or another allocation request. It can be cached with kmm caches, it can be used with the gen alloc or other methods. But in the end, everything is about uh, physical page allocator. So physical page allocator itself is really complex beast, and it needs memory to allocate its own data structures that it uses to manage the entire physical memory. But these data structures are not readily available at the time you start executing the kernel, and there needs, there Need, there is a need for some other mechanism to take care of uh, memory allocations before page allocator is available for normal use. So when bootloader jumps into the Linux kernel, that's more or less uh, the view of the physical memory. It's a bit difficult for me, so I just can wave my hands. Uh, <clears throat> there are several used regions, the kernel code, data, etc. Uh, the parameters bootloader passed to the Linux kernel, it can be command line, uh, some uh, data structure, uh, it can be device tree, it all depends on particular architecture. There is an optional init or D image that will be used as the very first initial user space file system. And there is sometimes a firmware data that uh, is live uh, during the kernel execution. It can be used or should be used when the kernel tries to access firmware or do something with it. This is also architecture dependent, not all architectures uh, leave that uh, piece. And uh, the most memory, as we can see here, the most of the memory is free. Uh, the problem is the kernel still doesn't know where it is. So whenever some code in the kernel tries to access some of the physical memory, uh, it can actually overwrite either kernel or init or D or some other important piece of information in the parameters that were passed from bootloader to the kernel. So it should, the kernel should be very careful it, what it does with the memory before the last bullet here, mm in it. So what happens, it's quite a lot of code that runs from the start uh, of the kernel till the point when the allocators are set up and uh, functional. So usually what's happening, it's also architecture dependent, but for the most part, assembly code sets up some basic page table, uh, basic page tables with the memory pre-allocated for them from the BSS in the kernel so that it won't overwrite some uh, essential information and uh, the fact that they are in the BSS already makes them visible and as a known location. The next step usually is that set up arch for each of 20 something architectures, detects the physical memory uh, configuration and uh, notifies the rest of the kernel where the physical memory lives, what is the starting address, what is the end address, how it's organized in banks, NUMA nodes, whatnot. And 
also set up architecture for each and every architecture in the kernel, make sure that the areas uh, from the previous slide, the kernel parameters inter-D, whatever essential data is there in memory that should live during the kernel execution is reserved and it, it, it's known for the rest of the kernel that this memory should not be touched. Then uh, start kernel uh, from the init main.c uh, must use um, early memory allocation because uh, it allocates several bu large buffers that page allocator won't, would, wouldn't grant to anyone uh, because of uh, certain restrictions. And only at that point, set start kernel calls mm init, which in turn transfers all the physical memory pages that were not yet reserved to the page allocator. And from that point, everyone can use page alloc, came alloc, and uh, so on and so on. And uh, I must note also that from, uh, from the beginning, of the kernel execution to the point where the memory management system is initialized. It's quite a lot of going on there. It's SMP initialization, it's C groups, kernel print key buffers, uh, all other kind of things. And they all must take proper care of their memory allocations. So what happened a long while ago uh, to do so until uh, Linux v2.3, uh, the code for, this is actually from historical Linux git trees. Uh, every function that was called from start kernel was passed memory start, memory end, and if it did some memory allocation, on, if it needed some memory, it just return the new memory start to account for the memory allocated for that particular or paging or console or PCI, whatever it is. So if, say, kmalloc init needed 1K of memories to create uh, metadata for kmalloc caches, it just received memory start saying 16 kilobytes, and then it returned 17 kilobytes as a new memory start for the rest of the system. In version 2.3, Point twenty-three press three, uh, uh, the, for the first time appeared a boot and memory allocator called bootmem, which was a first fit allocator based on bitmaps, uh, with every physical page represented by a bit in that bitmap. Zero says page is occupied. One say, uh, page is free. One says page is occupied, and then uh, the setup code for instance console, PCI init, et cetera, could use bitmap allocation functions. And they went to look up the free bits in the bitmap and then made, make sure that the pages uh, were reserved for that or another <coughs> function that allocated them. Uh, as the time went, uh, people discovered various problems with bootmap and that it was quite challenging in evolving infrastructure for memory, physical memory configuration. There appeared numerous systems. Not every machine had started its memory from address zero. It could move wherever in the 32 bits address space, I mean, physical address space. And for larger machine of that days, like 32 gigs of RAM, and the bitmap would be quite large. It would be one mega of bitmap. So searching that bitmap would be quite expensive. And uh, from version 2.5, uh, a new mechanism for early memory allocations was suggested. Uh, actually, it initially was implemented for PowerPC 64-bit. They didn't use bitmap at, uh, bootmap at all. They used uh, their own mechanism they called then uh, logical memory blocks, which eventually was renamed to memblock. And uh, as the time went, uh, it was adopted by more and more architectures. At, for a pretty long period, there existed a compatibility layer between memblock and bootmem. For instance, x86 
used that no boot mem compatibility layer so that actual memory allocations at early boot process were done by the mem block, but the rest of the system is seen in the older boot mem APIs. And boot mem was completely removed in 4.20. So the rest of this talk is about mem block. And I apologize for Android developers who are still using the older kernels. But still, uh, both bootmem and memblock API is pretty well documented, and uh, you can see the reference documentation in the uh, kernel documentation page at kernel.org. Now, uh, memblock does have some advantages over bootmem uh, because it uses static data structures embedded into the BSS, so it can be used straight away virtually from uh, even from the assembly code. You can call some mem block something and allocate uh, memory. It doesn't need to manage the, the, the boot memes bitmap, uh, which was uh, very difficult and you, you would see a lot of code trying to find the exact place where that bitmap can be placed and not to clobber with other important things in the memory. The other thing, the allocation itself has a bit more lo complex logic than simply tracking the last used bit in the bitmap. And one of more dangerous features of memblock is that whenever you allocate memory, it may implicitly grow the in internal data structures, allocate some more physical memory, and consequently clobber the memory you're already using. So some care should be taken to avoid this to happen. Uh, this is how memblock is represents the physical memory. So yellow is a memory bank. Suppose we have like, like I suppose we have four memory banks, and the, the blue blue rectangles are the memories that is already in use. So memblock has two structures called memblock type, one memblock type memory and one memblock type reserve. Each of these structures is an array of initially 188 entries, and each entry in the array represents a memory region, a continuous physical memory region. It has base size, some flags that allow to distinguish regions with different properties, uh, for instance, uh, mirrored memory, or all the crazy things with no maps that ARM people invented. And uh, <coughs> it has a node ID, so that memblock would know which memory, bank be be which, which memory banks belong to which NUMA node in the system. <coughs> uh, now the memory array represents memory bank memory banks as uh, plain physical memory banks. And the reserved array represents the used memory that uh, somebody in the kernel cared to tell memblock that, hey, I'm using this, so please take care of it. Uh, so these arrays are obviously not directly accessible for the modifications. You have to use APIs to modify them. Uh, and the basic APIs for dealing with memblocks arrays is memblock add or memblock add node. These get a base address and size of the region you would like to make uh, available to memblock, and that region goes into the memory array. So these functions effectively register physical memory banks with memblock. Then there is memblock remove which is kind of weird because uh, there is no hot plug at that time, but still some architectures want to make sure some parts of physical memory are not visible to the kernel and are not mapped by page allocator, but used solely by devices of firmware or some kind of th uh, things that are not exactly the kernel itself. So they choose to implement mem block remove and make some reservations of uh, physical memory for other purposes than normal kernel memory usage. 
There is also a man block reserve, which is the lowest level allocation function uh, that simply says, okay, I'm using it from here to here. This is my memory and I, I, want, it, I want it there and I don't want anybody to touch it. Uh, and there is man block free, so if you did some reservation of memory and you don't need that memory anymore, you can just free it and it will be available for any su subsequent reservation or whenever the pages are handed to the page allocator, it will be able to make use of that physical memory. But then, people realize that these basics are probably not enough to do actual memory management because every time you need to allocate memory, you have to search where the free memory is, then make it mem block reserved, and it was a repeating pattern for a lot of PowerPC code back then. So they've added several additional APIs that uh, were renamed with the time, but now they're called uh, memblock fizz alloc something. Uh, and what they do, uh, they allocate a chunk of physical memory uh, with specified alignment of specified size. And there are some modifications that uh, allow to restrict where the memory is allocated. For instance, memblock alloc range, fees alloc range allows to say, okay, I want a memory allocation between this physical address and that physical address, and memblock will try to satisfy that request. You can also try to allocate from a particular NUMA node if there is no memory in that particular NUMA node, memblock will fall back to other NUMA nodes. And so it, it tries as hard as possible to grant memory rather than to satisfy the uh, restrictions. Uh, all these uh, functions uh, are considered for now, at least by me, some, somewhat le legacy. Uh, and. Uh, Probably it's better to use the other set of functions uh, that I will cover in, in a bit. And these functions return physical address of the allocated memory. And on the contrary, there is another set of allocators that return virtual address of the allocated memory. And the two basic functions from that family is memblock alloc try need raw and memblock alloc try need. And so the shorter one uh, gets a whole bunch of restrictions where the memory should be located, what node it should be gotten from, and uh, some other flags that specify that probably memory should be with memory mirroring enabled or some other things. And uh, if the location succeeds, uh, including all the fallbacks memlock does implicitly, which I'll cover a bit later, uh, the memblock alloc try need uh, is going to convert the physical address of the memory it found into virtual address, do the mem set zero for the entire range allocated, and return that virtual address to the caller. Uh, for some of the early allocations of larger pieces of memory, the mem set zero was considered something that hurts performance and therefore should not be done because these areas are anyway initialized to something else. So people added mem block alloc try need raw, which does all the things that the try need does, but in the end it leaves the memory uh, unset and uh, it either contains garbage or it could be poisoned if your kernel has enough VM debug features turned on at build time or at boot time or even both. Now these two are large beasts and have way too many parameters for most users, so there is a bunch of convenience wrappers around the main block alloc try need and uh, they differ in the amount of restrictions they put for the memory allocations. Uh, the simplest one is memblock alloc, which is used in most of the places when somebody needs early memory, just receives size and alignment, and that's all. You don't need anything more than, if you don't need anything more than that, you're good to go with memblock alloc. Uh, 
Now, if you want to have your memory allocated above certain physical memory address, above certain physical address, probably you would want to use memblock alloc from, which tries to let you have your memory where you specified. If it cannot, it again falls back to the rest of the memory because for memlock it's more important to satisfy the allocation than to complain than to complain with all the restrictions. There is also memlock allo alloc law. Uh, for some architectures, what it was very important to have certain pieces uh, allocated from what's called low memory, for instance. Uh, I386 must have its DM, either DMA memory be below 16 megabytes. So there is a lot of code that allocates memory from lower memory regions, and uh, therefore this, uh, this wrapper is quite useful. And whenever somebody wants to allocate from a certain NUMA node, and it's the only restriction for the allocator, there is memblock alloc node which tries to give the requester memory from the exact NUMA node it asked for. And there is also memblock alloc row for those who do not want to have their memory cleared to zero and uh, for those who consider its performance drawback, they always can ask for memory as it is. And again, if enough EM debug features are turned on, it will be poisoned. Now, how the whole memblock allocation works. So suppose memblock got a request to allocate the, say, green rectangle. Uh, this one. Uh, so it will traverse uh, both memory and reserve the arrays to see where the free memory is which uh, the, yellow, the yellow bars uh, actually represent the free memory. And uh, it continues the traversal until it finds the free memory area large enough to satisfy the requ allocation request. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, after the memory found, it will be reserved and there will be a new entry in memory in memblock reserved array that will represent the reserved memory. Uh, if the allocation, if there are some allocations uh, that have uh, adjacent addresses, a uh, memblock tries to merge them uh, so the array won't grow beyond uh, some limits. And uh, here, a memblock can implicitly grow the reserved array if you had already allocated 188 areas and you're allocated allocating the 199th area, uh, the array will be doubled. And this, of course, has a possibility of uh, overwriting some of the used memory. So uh, some caution should be taken that won't, won't, don't, won't happen. And I'll talk about it a bit later. So the basic function that traverses the uh, uh, arrays is memblock find in range node, which takes into account all the restrictions and uh, all the criteria, like uh, minimal address, maximal address, flags, and uh, NUMA node. Uh, and uh, it can search in both directions, both bottom up and top down. The default for memblock is top down allocation, so it starts from the end of the memory, but there is a control a method that allows to force bottom-up allocations. Now, these two basic functions are never called, more almost never called by themselves. There is also a wrappers for them that, uh, that do a, like in a loop allocation uh, so that memblock alloc range need tries to make the allocation with a whole bunch of restrictions user put there. Uh, but if it fails, it retries to allocate memory from other node in the system. 
So that allocation will succeed if the particular node doesn't have enough memory to accommodate the request. And this function uh, returns a physical address of the allocated memory. And then there is alloc internal, which actually implements all the memblock alloc functions that return virtual address that that does another retry without lower bound for the allocation. So if somebody said, okay, I want memory about this address and memblock alloc range need, didn't succeed to find memory above this address, memblock alloc internal will try to find memory below that address as well. There is a bunch of functions that allow uh, controlling the behavior of the allocator itself. So to avoid the problem of a growing implicit growth of a reserved array, a, you can disable array resizing with memblock allow resize, which gets true or false, and respectively you either disable or enable resize of memblock arrays. A, in, case you restrict, you disabled uh, implicit growth of the arrays, your location will fail and you get nice uh, crash, but uh, still you know you, some, you did something wrong instead of uh, having some memory corruption along the road uh, in a few milliseconds. Then there is ability to set bottom up or top down direction. And then every architecture thought they need a different way of limiting the actual memory that can be used for the memory allocations. So there is a whole bunch of setting limits which behave more or less the same but a bit different and uh, each one of them is simply used by different architectures that implemented it and pushed it some time ago into the mem block. Probably in some time, uh, some time uh, going along will unify at least some of them. Next, uh, you can query the mem block state and see uh, what's going on there. There is a method to find out what is your physical memory size rather than go and ask firmware or, or traverse all the mem block arrays. Uh, it just can tell you. It can tell you how much reserved memory there is in the system. It can tell you what is your start of physical RAM and where it ends which is useful, for instance, on arms that may have a lot, lot of uh, possibilities for physical memory mapping. It actually depends on the SOC vendor. Uh, you can check if some physical address is actually in physical memory, if it's already used, and you can see what is the highest uh, load address for the memory allocations. Uh, if you need something beyond these interfaces that are already available, you can simply traverse uh, the mem block arrays with a lot of different iterators. Either it's, uh, it's not the full list, by the way, there are more of them. And each of the iterators have some differences. Uh, so most important, uh, for, for each frame range that traverses the intersection between memory and reserved arrays. So what you get is actually free memory regions and you can do something with them. And then another one is for each reserved memory region which is used mostly at the time when memblock hands over the memory to the page allocator so the page allocator will know that uh, this memory is already in use and uh, will not allocate it to somebody else. So most of them are pretty well documented and you can take a look at the kernel documentation if you'd like. So now let's return a bit to the memory management initialization. Uh, the important piece that should be taken care of and uh, all architecture do, do this mostly right is that the kernel init rd firmware pages, whatever memory is occupied by the time kernel starts should be reserved as soon as possible. And then uh, 
and then uh, you can run with the mem block resize on and allocate memory as, as much as you need, as long as you have all the reserved areas reserved very early in the boot process. The next thing that's going on uh, is uh, the detection of physical memory. As we already seen, uh, each architecture does it in its own way. Uh, it queries firmware, uh, reads this from the device tree, asks BIOS, whatever it's not. It's also important to have this piece as, uh, as soon as possible so you'll be able to allocate physical memory. And then if a certain machine has some restrictions uh, for physical memory availability, like you'd like to have all your upper banks available only to DSP or virtual machines or whatever, you can limit a mem block and ensure that it won't allocate that physical memory for normal kernel usage. And in the end of this boot memory, boot, boot process, a start kernel calls mem init, uh, which in turn calls mem block free all, and at the time mem block traverses all the memory and reserves arrays, and passes the whole physical memory to the page allocator, and voila, you can you can live normally. You have kmalloc. So uh, these are some references I use uh, I used in the talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>